So I'll just repeat the question. Has forgiveness played a big part in your life because of what you've gone through? No. No, I'm afraid I can't forgive them. I can't forget it. It hurts every time I speak. The question is, how, how do you view the tidal wave of anti-Semitism that's been rising in Europe? Very uh, and what do you think about Alia, which is going to Israel, Jewish yeah. people going to Israel? I can tell you that I tell my, my grandchildren when they say, I, the, 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 in pride that have, they have Jewish part in them. I said, don't broadcast it. It's so ingrained not to let this any know because it might turn around because it turned to up us before. So I said, well, don't broadcast it. It's still the, the fear. Uh, how, how typical was it for Polish people to get involved in helping Jewish people at that time? Yeah. Well, those that, those that helped, I'm very, very happy, think uh, very well of them. But unfortunately, most Polish people were anti Semitic. They were anti-Semitic even after the war. Yes, another question, please. It's not really a question, it's just an observation that my father was a survivor, but he wasn't a child. He managed to escape, but my grandmother uh, was murdered at um, Minsk. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say this, that people have often had the idea that Treasonstadt was not too bad. The Germans made it look like it was a much lighter regime. But my grandmother was taken in, you mentioned that 1942, well that was the year my uh, grandmother was taken to um, to Riesenstadt. Only before the end of the record, only three weeks and then they moved her to uh, mm. uh, uh, Minsk. It's got another name, mainly Trubinsk or something like that. But she was murdered the same day or the next day when yeah. she arrived there. My mother was. She mm. was taken to, to Belgium. Belgium. Mm. And I only got to know when I went to, we went on a tour, Shorish tour, to Poland, um, that where she was taken to, yes. and um, all I could put is a bunch of flowers under her name that was there. Yeah. So, and that was at 42, beginning of 42. Yeah. So just to explain, pe people will have heard of the camps. We use the term concentration camps broadly. Um, but it was but, a death but, camp. But yeah, there were, there were different types. So Theresa Stark was a kind of show camp. It was, it was pretty unique. Uh, and it was just to try and fool parts of the world that, that things weren't as bad as they were. There were work camps, like uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau was a work camp. So we're basically for slave labor, where people were worked to death. And then there were the straightforward death camps and Auschwitz had a death camp element to it, but there were others like Sobibor and Treblinka and Belzec, and I don't know about Minsk, what category that was in, but... I think looking at the uh, display at Yad Vashem, it looks like uh, often when they went to Minsk, they just shot them and put them into a hole. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. So just a straight death camp. So there were, there were different camps, obviously, and, and it, to a certain extent, how long you lived depended on where you went. I mean, one thing we didn't mention, I will mention this actually, one thing we found out when we went back in 98 and we, and we found Ivan, who was, um, and that was an, that's an amazing, it's a great story in itself, but we won't bore you with it now. But um, we, event, we did eventually track down uh, the boy um, called Ivan, now of course an old man, um, who, who was in Fedio's son. And he told us that in fact, when the two, the two partisans in their German uniforms came to the farm and discovered uh, my mother, uh, they were actually spotted. 
and some, uh, uh, an informer went back to the town, the main town, and said, have you got two, two uh, German soldiers that you sent on patrol up on, up on Schimonka on the mountain? Uh, and, of course, the German officer said no. Um, so they said, right, we'll, we'll send a patrol out and we'll catch them. And, uh, of course, this patrol, had it, had it gone to the right place, would have found them and would have found Hava and, every, and everybody would have been killed. But they had to get a guide to take them there. And the guide that they got to take them there was uh, obviously a poor man, but he was a, a man that Fedio had been kind to. Okay? I, you know, I'm not sure this is true exactly, but he'd given him some sausages or something. I think it was sausages that he'd given him as an act of kindness. Whether it was from one of these animals that he'd killed illegally or not, that I don't know. But because of that act, one act of kindness, instead of taking the German patrol to Fedio's farm, he took them to a nearby village where he knew there were some communist partisans. They were different. There were Jewish partisans, green partisans, Ukrainian nationalists, red partisans, communist partisans. Anyway, he knew that there were some red partisans in this nearby village, and he took the Germans there. The Germans had their fight, so they were happy. And that is the only reason that I'm sitting here today. So it was, you know, every day you had to roll a double six with the dice, if you like. Every day you had to be incredibly lucky. And if you were incredibly lucky, every day for three years you could come through. Or you, could, you don't necessarily have to see it as luck, of course. But but why the Lord should protect one and not another, who, who can answer that? But that's how it was. You showed us on a map, the side of a mass grave. Is that now cared for? No. no. No, literally. I mean, we, we went, well, unless things have changed in the last 10 years. We, we, we went to say a prayer, so for me to say Kaddish, uh, for the family that were, that were killed. When we first went there, we didn't know where to go. We went nearby, into, down to the River Valley. It was only actually after we said the prayer that we made the contact that gave us access to the guy that knew where Zagelny was, and it actually eventually linked us to the Dobransky family. Uh, so he took us to this place, and we were walking, we were walking across that field uh, that I showed you from the, from the, from the air, walking towards the, the trees. And we were literally, he just stopped and said, it's here. And we had n didn't know what he was talking about. No expectation at all. We were kind of, you know, you, you know, you know what a mass grave looks like. It's supposed to have a mound. And anyway, we, he, he just stopped and he said, "It's here. You're on it. You're literally on it." And we looked around at our feet, and we could see that where we were, the ground was kind of undulating. Not, you know, not by much, but undulating. Uh, and you could just about tr trace out the border of a, of a rectangle. We could because they never tilled the soil there. It's all weeds, and it's sort of uneven, you know. Mm. You know, the, the area around it is, is even, you know, because they, they, they grew things on it. But that bit was just... Yeah. I mean, so the, the reality is... And we met the man that wor worked in the in Sigelnia, in the, and, and he, he remembered having to go and dig yeah. the hole, and... Uh, he, he, he lived in the valley just below it, yeah. and um, he was very kind as well. He, he, he said that it was a terrible time. Yeah, it, it's difficult. To, there's absolutely nothing there. No memory, no... There's a sense, of course, in which there's a mixture of shame, guilt, and impotence, if you like, about it. When, when we went to the hospital, and, and really worked out where the old family farmhouse was. We went there, and all that was left of the original farm was some little low building that had been like a hut, because they, they'd now put a new house there. At the side of the house, there was this roof. You know, when the house sinks down, the roof, that's what remained of the cow shed, but the whole thing sunk. That's the only remains of my grandparents' farm. The house had gone and been yeah. replaced by a new one, yes. I mean, I mean we, we haven't, I mean, we don't have time, but we haven't explained. We, we, the binders were the, uh, the poor, we were very much, we were the poor family among the Jews 
you know. Not the poor, one of the yeah, poor. We were. Uh, I mean, what, one famous fa well, what, what family story is that because my uh, grandmother, her family wasn't rich enough for my grandfather's parents, he had to lend money to his father-in-law so that he could give a dowry that would be good enough to impress his parents. So, uh, but anyway, so I, I, it, it, I'm sure it wasn't a very spectacular palatial place uh, and it's, it's since gone. But I just, I only said it to illustrate the fact that, that, that people are conflicted there about it. They, they, don't, they don't mourn the loss of the Jews and say how tragic and put up a, a memorial, a few flowers and say, you know, it's really sad, but you know, those days are gone. There, there's a kind of underlying guilt about it as well, I think. 50 or 60 percent Poles in the Ukraine and, and 40 percent um, Jews in the town. Now there's no Jews in the town. And it's all, the Poles were chucked out and all the, the, it's all Ukrainian. Yeah, uh, the population is still not as big as it was no. in 1921. In, instead of 10,000, there's 7,000 now. now. <laughs> Okay, I think that's, that, that's probably enough for one afternoon. Thank you for listening so, so patiently. I hope, particularly you young people, I hope you remember what you've heard today. And I hope when you hear people tell you, and they will do, before you die, people will tell you this didn't happen. Okay? People will tell your children that this didn't happen, or it didn't really happen like this, or it's all exaggerated. When they do, just tell them... No, I, I heard it. I heard it from someone that was there. And uh, teach your children. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.